Well, we've come to the end of Unit 5 and to the end of the course. So what I would like to do in this lecture is just quickly review some of the key points of the wide variety of topics that we've discussed in Unit 5. There are a number of different topics. We began with a couple of lectures on MOSFETs. We continued the discussion of the course on MOSFETs. But then we also looked at two different kinds of transistors, one known as the HEMP and the bipolar junction transistor. And then we said a few words to wrap up the course on compact models. So, in terms of the limits of MOSFETs, this is a very important question. Moore's Law, the continual downscaling of transistor dimensions, which has powered the increase in electronic performance for the last 50, 60 years or so, is all about shrinking the size of transistors. So it's natural to ask, how small can we make a transistor? Our energy barrier model of the MOSFET gave us a very simple way to establish some very fundamental limits. Uh, in the off state, we had a large barrier between the, between the source and the channel, and an even large barrier between the drain and the channel. In the on state, we push that barrier down, the electrons flow from the source to the drain, and then they dissipate their energy in the drain by inelastic scattering events. Um, so that very simple model for a MOSFET allowed us to establish some fundamental limits. This is the answer. Minimum switching speed was kT log 2, which is a very small number. Minimum channel length is on the order of a nanometer or so. Minimum switching time is about 40 femtoseconds. We then said, let's compare those fundamental limits to where we are today. And what we found is that we are, I think, surprisingly close to some of those fundamental limits. The switching energy, the energy it takes to convert a 1 to a 0 or vice versa, in a MOSFET is 1 half gate capacitance times power supply voltage squared. If you do that with a 22 nanometer MOSFET, you'll find it's about 1,200 times its minimum. Right. You know, why is it 1,200 times? Well, one of the reasons is we're using a much larger power supply voltage than we fundamentally need. We, we must use that power supply voltage because of the nature of the IV characteristics. The 60 millivolt per decade subthreshold swing means that we need a power supply voltage that will give us a sufficiently low off current and a sufficiently high on current, and that takes on the order of a volt, far larger than uh, KT log 2 divided by Q, which would be the minimum voltage. But the minimum, oh, and I'll mention in, in a practical circuit, capacitance is a huge issue. There is all kinds of wiring capacitance as we're connecting one gate to multiple other gates and sending signals across the chip. So that in practice, uh, circuits really operate orders of magnitude above this fundamental limit. And it seems really hard to get much closer to that. We always have capacitance, and unless we have a transistor with an IV characteristic that switches over a much smaller range of voltages, this is really hard to do much about. Channel length, 22 nanometers, is only about 15 times the minimum that we established. And the intrinsic device delay time is only about an order of magnitude bigger. So we're relatively close to some fundamental limits. It's harder and harder to push closer and closer. We pushed so far over 50, 60 years. So, key points, transistors are operating really quite close to some fundamental limits. There are practical issues that need to be dealt with, and these have been real challenges and are becoming increasing challenges. Uh, series resistance, parasitic capacitance, various tunneling leakage currents. These make it difficult to push uh, even deeper towards these fundamental limits. But our arguments on these limits, we, we uh, showed that they can also be established by very general thermodynamic and quantum mechanical arguments. So they apply not just to our MOSFET, but they would apply to any switching device we can conceive of. So it'll be difficult to even replace the MOSFET with another device and get significantly closer to these fundamental limits. Well, we spent a lot of time talking about digital applications. We spent a little bit of time talking about analog applications. There are other applications for transistors. One important application is in power electronics, where a MOSFET is operated as a switch. So we talked a little bit. There are several different power electronic devices and several different flavors of devices and designs. We talked about one device simply to 
uh, illustrate some of the considerations and show that MOSFETs can be used in other ways. So that was a power MOSFET. So for power electronics, we need high currents. That means we need MOSFETs that are very wide, but we don't, don't want to take up a lot of semiconductor area because that's expensive. We need high breakdown voltages, which means we need to spread the voltage out across a long distance, so we lower the electric fields so that the semiconductor doesn't break down. Uh, that, again, would take a large device, and we want to minimize the device dimensions as much as possible. So to achieve these goals, power MOSFETs have this kind of cellular structure that wraps a lot of width into a small area. And the current flows vertically through the wafer, where we can get a long distance to spread out the electric fields. This, this plot, you should realize, is not to scale. The vertical distance is much uh, longer than the lateral distance here. Okay, so that's the basic design. This is a diffused MOSFET or a D MOSFET. That's one flavor of power MOSFET. Uh, we have a source, two parallel sources on the top. We have a P-type channel here that can be turned on with this gate. The drain is down in the bottom. When we apply a gate voltage and turn on the channel, the current flows across the gate and then down and out the drain. So the current flow is vertical. The breakdown voltage of this, we, not, we need not only a lot of current and low resistance, we need high breakdown voltage. The breakdown voltage is determined across this PN junction. So we'd like to make the doping as light as possible to make the electric fields as small as possible, make the thickness of the wafer as large as possible. We went through some simple arguments that showed that there was a fundamental trade-off between the on resistance, which we want to be low, and the breakdown or blocking voltage, VB, which we want to be high. And that fundamental trade-off depends on the critical breakdown field of the semiconductor. So we can compute it for silicon, a wider band gap material like silicon carbide, which has a higher field for breakdown, uh, will allow us to push at the same on resistances to much higher voltages. And gallium nitride, in principle, which has an even higher critical field, uh, would allow us to push even higher into this high voltage regime and approach 10,000 volt operation uh, for these power MOSFET devices. Okay, then we switch gears again. We talked about a device that is widely used in RF applications. That's called a high electron mobility transistor. It looks something like a MOSFET. It's got a small band gap region that is the channel. Uh, frequently in this particular device, it's indium gallium arsenide. The more indium we put in, the higher the mobilities. The mobilities in these channels can approach 10,000. They're very high mobility. It has a wide band gap semiconductor, not as wide as the insulators we use in MOSFETs, but wider. We sort of think of this as the uh, as the insulator in a MOSFET. And then it has a gate, which acts as a Schottky barrier gate, which modulates the energy barrier, and this is another flavor of barrier-controlled transistor. The fundamental physics in this device is something very neat, which is known as modulation doping. Modulation of doping allows us to dope the wide band gap material, the electrons spill down into the small band gap layer, we get carriers in the small band gap layer, which is our channel, but we didn't dope it, so we don't get the ionized impurity scattering due to the dopants. So that neat trick allows us to produce very high mobilities. It allows us to produce transistors that perform much better than the gallium arsenide MESFETs, which were the first 3.5 transistor. Gallium arsenide MESFETs made use of a doped gallium arsenide channel. Now, and a Schottky barrier then, which depleted that channel and modulated its conductance. The attraction for gallium arsenide was it had a very high mobility, when it's pure especially. Uh, but we need to dope the channel because we need carriers too. And when we dope the channel, the mobility goes down significantly. So for high transconductance, we need both velocity and we need charge. So we need mobility and we need charge. So we have to dope it, but that lowers the mobility. So that was the trade-off that modulation doping allowed us to get around. Okay. And you know the fact that the, we have a Schottky barrier here, that sort of limits us because we have to be careful what voltages we apply. We don't have a wide band gap insulator like we do in a MOSFET. So that's something that, is, uh, that we need to be careful about in transistors of this kind. So just a quick summary about HEMPs. 
Uh, these are 3.5 devices that can uh, achieve terahertz RF performance, so they're very important for RF applications. Uh, both HEMPs and the HPTs that we talked about later have been able to achieve terahertz performance. So when we need to go to these very high frequencies, these are the devices of choice. Uh, HEMPs operate in exactly the same barrier-controlled mode as MOSFETs, uh, so our virtual source model is a good model for HEMPs as well. One of the interesting things is that because the mobility in HEMPs is so high, HEMPs operate essentially at the ballistic limit. So these are transistors that are manufactured today that are essentially at the ballistic limit. We then switched gears and talked about another type of transistor, which is sometimes thought of as a fundamentally different kind of transistor, but which we learned to think about as just another flavor of barrier control transistor. This is an energy band diagram. Here I have an n-type emitter, a p-type base, and an n-type collector. Looks very similar to an n-type source, p-type channel, n-type drain. We apply a forward bias to the base. We apply it directly. We don't apply it through a gate and a gate insulator, and we have there's no voltage drop across the gate insulator. All of the voltage drop goes across the PN junction. We pull the P region down, we lower the energy barrier uh, between the source and the uh, pace. At the same time, we apply a positive voltage to the collector and pull everything down in the collector. So now that we've lowered the energy barrier between the emitter and the base, electrons can hop over that barrier, diffuse across, flow downhill and out the collector contact, and that's how current flows. Very similar to a MOSFET, we simply modulate the barrier height directly on the PN junction instead of indirectly through an MOS structure. We did some simple analysis after refreshing ourselves with some basic PN junction theory. We developed a uh, expression for beta, the ratio of the collector to base currents. So one of the undesirable features of this structure is that we don't have a gate insulator. Current flows in the base terminal. We like that current to be as small as possible. In fact, in practice, we use that current to set the voltage between the base and the emitter. Because the current depends exponentially on that voltage, it's easier for us to set the current. That is sometimes leads to some confusion because people think that, well, this is a current-controlled device. Uh, which is inherently different from the MOSFET, which is a voltage control device. But really, the current is only used to set the base to emitter voltage. So we have this expression, which relates the doping densities in the emitter and the base, the diffusion coefficient of minority carriers in the emitter and the base, the widths of the neutral parts of the emitter and the base, and the intrinsic carrier concentrations in the two region. Uh, well, knowing those numbers, we can compute the beta or the current gain. And we need a beta of 10, 20 or more in order to do reasonable circuits. We saw that the IV characteristics of this device look very similar to the output characteristics of a MOSFET. Uh, we're stepping now base current instead of stepping gate voltage as we did in a MOSFET. Uh, the region that we operate in for RF circuits is like the saturation region for a MOSFET. We call it the forward active region of the bipolar transistor. That's the region where the base emitter junction is forward biased to inject electrons into the base. The base collector junction is reverse biased to collect those electrons when they diffuse across the base. Okay. And beta is a very important figure of merit for those kinds, these kinds of transistors. When we plot the transfer characteristic, we see that they have ideal subthreshold slope because there's no gate oxide to limit the subthreshold slope. Um, it sort of looks like at high currents they roll off. And it looks like above threshold on a MOSFET, but these are actually much higher currents than in a MOSFET, and the roll off is uh, due to series resistances, not to uh, bolt drops across insulators. Okay, now we compared MOSFETs and bipolars. Why are bipolar transistors still of interest? Well, a key figure of merit for a transistor as an analog amplifier is its transconductance. We saw that we could write the transconductance as current divided by some voltage. The voltage for the MOSFET was VGS minus threshold voltage. The voltage for the BJ BJT was KT over Q. VGS minus VT for a, for a MOSFET is on the order of several tenths of a volt. 
KT over Q is very much smaller. So this voltage in the denominator for a MOSFET is roughly 30 times higher than the voltage in the denominator for the bipolar transistor. So the transconductance of a MOSFET is roughly 30 times smaller than the transconductance of a bipolar. Bipolars are 30 times better than MOSFETs. This is one of the key benefits of a bipolar. When you need this very high transconductance, you would look towards a bipolar transistor. Now, both bipolar transistors and MOSFETs have achieved terahertz performance. Um, the maximum, uh, the unity gain bandwidth product, F sub t, is transconductance divided by 2 pi times the total device capacitance. For MOSFETs, the capacitance can be very low, so even though the transconductance is low, good FTs can be obtained. For bipolars, the capacitance tends to be higher, but the transconductance is much higher, so you can also achieve comparable FTs. The thing that bipolars uh, offer is this very high transconductance, which can be useful and makes them well suited when you need a lot of drive current and high power RF amplifiers. Now, if you look inside your cell phone, there will be billions and billions and billions of CMOS transistors doing all of the digital logic and everything that needs to be done. There might be some power MOSFETs that do some power management inside there as well. But there will be one bipolar transistor, maybe a silicon germanium HBT. And that's because most of our personal electronics has wireless communication, and this device is well suited to that type of wireless communication. So the silicon germanium HBT is a heterojunction bipolar transistor. A heterojunction bipolar transistor is made of two different kinds of semiconductors. The classic HBT has a wide band gap emitter. What the wide band gap emitter does is, if we look at this expression for the current gain, is it makes Ni squared in the base different from Ni squared in the emitter. Recall that Ni squared is proportional to e to the minus band gap over kT. If the band gap in the emitter is wider than the band gap in the base, then Ni squared in the emitter will be exponentially smaller than the Ni squared in the base. This last factor will be very much bigger than 1, and that means we can use that to advantage because that means we don't have to be as careful about the ratio of these doping densities. We can, in fact, dope the base much more heavily than we dope the emitter and still get good current gain. The much more heavily doped base has lower base series resistance, and that's very beneficial from a circuit design point of view. Sometimes you'll see double heterojunction bipolar transistors, which use another heterojunction on the collector. So there are some advantages there. It's a more symmetrical device, so it reduces the collector offset voltage, which is one of the consequences of this asymmetry. It's also, since it has a wider band gap, and we're going to reverse bias this function, this is where breakdown will occur, but the wider band gap increases the breakdown voltage. So just a quick summary of what we learned about HBTs. They're important uh, technology, especially when we need RF power. Silicon germanium HBTs are especially important in uh, wireless personal electronics uh, products. HBTs offer speeds that are close to HEMPs. Both have achieved terahertz uh, frequency operations. Uh, compared to HEMPs, HBTs deliver a higher power, uh, more integration density also is because of the, the particular way the technology works. But HBTs, just like hemp and just like MOSFETs, are barrier-controlled uh, transistors. So they operate in that same mode and with that same kind of understanding that we have for MOSFETs. We wrapped up the uh, course by just saying a few words about compact circuit model, uh, models. The key points were that this is the link between semiconductor manufacturing and circuit design. It's also increasingly a link between semiconductor research and applications, the eventual applications that they're striving to impact. Uh, developing a uh, good circuit model requires a good understanding of the device physics because we want the model to be physics-based, but it also requires an understanding of how circuit simulation, electronic circuit simulation programs work because the model has to work in that environment. And it also requires an understanding of the application so that we know which particular features of the device need to be most accurately modeled. 
And there have been many, many lessons. There are a lot of pitfalls in developing compact models. A lot of those have been learned in very painful ways over the years. But if you're developing a model for a new device, I would encourage you to try to learn those lessons as much as you can. All right, so this wraps up the course. We have uh, described a lot of topics. The first four units were all focused on the MOSFET, which is the most widely used transistor in applications today. Uh, in unit five, we were able to talk about some additional topics, including some additional types of transistors that have important applications in certain critical places. So I hope that uh, you have enjoyed taking this course as much as I've enjoyed teaching it. And I'll wish you good luck in your career in electronics and in your work with transistors.